Well, good morning, Fellowship Baptist Church. Welcome to our online service. We are so happy that you can come and worship with us today. Before we get to our time of worship, I just want to uh, tell you, the parents, that if you go to our website, to fbcdrumheller.com, and you go to our kids page, there is a whole area for your kids, uh, a kid's message and kid's activities that you can avail yourself to. So make sure you go and do that. Well, without further ado, uh, let's pray and then let's worship together. Father, we thank you, Lord, that we can come together, uh, Lord, even though we are apart, Lord, we are together in spirit, Lord. I ask that you move amongst us in our homes. Father, I ask that uh, you would just touch all those who maybe are lonely or hurting or going through a hard time. May, Lord, may you be their love and their joy and their peace during this time. Father, I pray that you bless our service this morning. God, may it be fruitful and edifying and cause us to become more like you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's worship together.
such amazing volunteers who uh, put so much work into uh, uh, making our online service an, a great time for you who are watching with our singing and announcements and and then of course Pastor Mike uh, bringing an amazing word that we'll get to hear soon. But first we have a couple of announcements. If you go to our website fbcdrumheller.com and you go to the video portion, you'll see a link to download our bulletin that you can avail yourself to all the information in that link. Uh, but I'll just go over some of the high level stuff for you today. First and foremost, there was an announcement uh, made about the potential of opening up June 21st for in-person uh, service meetings. Uh, that will no longer uh, be happening. Uh, Pastor Mike posted a video on our website detailing all the information that you need to know about it. So if you've watched that video, great. If you haven't, go to our website, fbcdrumheller.com. You'll see a big red banner at the top. You won't miss it. It says FBC's response to COVID-19. Click on that banner, scroll down, and you'll see an update section, and you can watch Watch the video there. And if you have any questions, feel free to contact Pastor Mike. For all of updated information, though, just segueing through that, please be checking our website uh, regularly, especially on that page of FBC's response. You'll see updates for what's happening and what's the church doing. And, but also on that page, you'll see a card that says Conversations of Hope where you can click on and Pastor Mike will be releasing uh, weekly videos of uh, hope-filled messages from the Word of God uh, that will bring hope and, and joy into your life. They're not sermons. They're not super long. They're nice and short for you to enjoy with your family. So uh, make sure you avail yourself to all of that. Also, 
On our website, you'll see uh, a section for uh, ways to give. That is, uh, uh, we, we are so thankful for your generosity and your consistency through this time. You guys are so amazing. Uh, it, so if you, if you need to learn more ways of how to give or, or you're not sure and you're still a little foggy on how to do it, there's a page on our website that details all of that. The most easy and convenient way for you would be to e-transfer the church at giving at fbcdrumheller.com as you guys already all know because you're so amazing. Uh, also on our website, every Tuesday on the kids page, there's a title called Kids Do. And if you click on Kids Do, every Tuesday there'll be a short little video and some material that you can download and work through with your kids or have your kids work through on their own that will bring them joy and encouragement. Uh, so make sure you avail yourself to the Kids Do page every Tuesday for some awesome video teaching and some material that can keep your kids busy, especially throughout the summer where they're all going to be running wild uh, anyways. So uh, make sure you go to Kids Do every Tuesday. Well, without further ado, we're going to pray and then we're going to call up Pastor Mike. But I again just want to make one last uh, mention about the video on our updated page on our website. Make sure that you are watching that and you are informed on what our church is doing. And please feel free to ask questions. Mike has an awesome message for us that is titled, We Can't Talk About Heaven Without Talking About. What's the about? Well, you're going to have to just wait and see. Let's pray. Father, I thank you, Lord, for the ones who watching, Lord, and the ones who are going to be watching later, both on Facebook, on our website, or on YouTube, Lord, wherever they're finding themselves watching. God, I ask that you bless them. Lord, God, through this, this message time, as we gleam at heaven and our future home, Lord, and living with you in perfect peace and unity for eternity, Lord, may that just bring about joy. Lord, that this life is not all there is. God, that this pain that we experience now is just momentary in light of your glory, Lord Jesus, that we will have forever. Father, may that bring us comfort in the face of trials. May that bring us comfort even in the good times of life, that this is not as good as it will get. It will get better. So, Lord, we thank you that you are better, better than our sin, better than our desires, better than anything that we could wish for, Lord, that you are greater. So we thank you for that, Lord. Would you teach us to be satisfied in you alone? In Jesus' name, amen. All right, I pray that you are blessed today by the message. Hello and good morning. Welcome to Fellowship Baptist Church and our message time. And uh, we're in a series called Simply Heaven. And we've gone through a lot. We've gone through eight weeks of studying and, and digging deep into what heaven, the, the present heaven as well as the eternal heaven, will look like. And, and where do we go after we die? Uh, and we've answered a lot of your questions. But if you still have questions, next week I will do a Q&A on your questions. You can either go onto uh, our website and just type in a, uh, a message in the, in the little uh, dialogue box, a chat box that happens. Uh, if you're part of our congregation, you would have received a, a survey months ago uh, in regard to this series. And in that is a question. Uh, one of the questions right at the end is just simply, do you have any questions for this series? Or you can email me, michael at fbcdrumheller.com. And Next week, we'll answer all the questions that you have uh, put together. One of the fundamental things about talking about heaven is that eventually you have to talk about H-E double hockey sticks. Um, no, you have to talk about hell. Uh, that, that is fundamental, I believe, in, in discussing heaven. You cannot separate the two. So today, that is our topic. Uh, we'll be talking about hell, look, examining from the Word of God what is expressed there. And uh, thanks for joining with us. We're going to be in Matthew 25, mostly, and then uh, as well as in Revelation 20. So if you have a Bible, uh, you can uh, kind of put your finger in both of those. Uh, I'll be sharing some other verses as well, but uh, for now, uh, those two are kind of the, the biggies for today. Before we get into it, let's uh, pray, 
and uh, we'll dive right into this study on hell. Father, I thank you so much that you are here among us. I thank you for your spirit. I thank you, Lord, that uh, even though we are separate, separated by uh, physicality, I thank you, Lord, that we have the technology to be able to, to share, to encourage, to strengthen one another. And so now, Lord, as we continue our series in heaven, uh, Lord, this one may be a tough one, examining the concept of hell. So I ask, Lord, that you will remove any distractions from our minds and in our hearts and allow us to, to see you, see your love, see your grace that is expressed here. Father, through it all, may you get the praise and the glory. In Christ's name, amen. So when we discuss heaven and consider heaven, we cannot exclude hell. They are mutually exclusive. They're not equal opposites. They're not equal at all. <laughs> um, it's kind of like uh, thinking about God. Does God have an equal? Uh, no, he doesn't. Uh, his heaven, his home, his, ab his abode uh, will not have an equal opposite. And yet the, bi the biblical teaching of both destinations stands or falls together. You cannot have one without the other. I think one of the reasons why we don't like talking about heaven is not only do we not know enough about it, and I hope through this series uh, this has helped in some way, shape, or form, uh, but maybe it's deep down inside of our hearts and our minds. When we look at heaven, we, we know we have to consider hell. They are a package deal. I kind of liken it to, uh, to flowers and bees. Okay? You, you have to have the bee for the flower, and you have to have the flower for the bee. They're, they're, they're there, but they're different, and they're unique, and they, all have, they both have different roles. Um, first part of this message I'm going to talk about, uh, kind of the, the beliefs or ideas or thoughts that people have about heaven. There's really categorized into five different ideas or ideologies, uh, worldviews of the concept of hell. Uh, first off, some people think mm, there's no such place. No such place as hell. Um, it's a bit of a denial uh, viewpoint, and yet there are many that, that believe that. Uh, maybe it's in, in their minds they think it's just a story that is kind of made up so that people get guilted into going to church or guilted into money or, or something like that. They say that hell just doesn't exist. Uh, and if you take this view, then really, in essence, you have to take the view that there is no heaven, because they're, they're mu mu mutually exclusive. If there is no hell, there is, can be no heaven. So there has to be then, therefore, a denial of heaven, as well as a denial of, of hell. In fact, that's what some religions and some cults uh, of the world teach. Mormonism. Uh, they argue that the, the false doctrine of the punishment to be visited upon erring souls is endless, is at once unscriptural, unreasonable, and revolting. So they just say hell doesn't exist. Uh, Christian science is another one. They teach that there is no death. Uh, but they also believe something else. They believe that heaven and hell are, are states of thought, not real places. People experience their own heaven or their own hell right here on earth, which leads to a second kind of worldview or ideology of hell. And that is that it speaks of earthly suffering. There are those that will say that hell on earth, that's the, the, the earthly suffering is truly hell in their minds. Hell is only the bad things you and I go through on earth. Another theory or another uh, worldview is annihilism or annihilation. Um, this is the belief that, that people are just going to get destroyed at the end. Uh, that's the final des destruction of evil beings. Now, this may, you may have a belief in heaven, but there also may be this, this concept of annihilation. Um, this can also be called conditional immorality or immortality uh, or conditionalism or annihilationism. Um, here, the idea is that an unsaved or 
or are, are an unbeliever, they're punished in a place called hell for a, a finite interval, not an infinite. So it's a, a bit of time. And during that duration of, uh, uh, for lack of a better term, one sentence in hell, uh, they, they're determined, and, and their, their length of time is determined by their seriousness of what they did on earth. Um, so, and then during that time, they, they are, they're given opportunity to kind of redeem themselves. And if they do, then they go into hev heaven. But if not, that they, they, they experience the second death, so to speak, and uh, they get annihilated. Um, supporters of this belief must necessarily abandon the concept of an immortal soul, meaning that our soul lives on forever. Um, they do have to abandon that concept, and to do that, I, I personally think you have to be creative in some of the interpretations of biblical passages that kind of fit uh, that immortal soul kind of concept. So to fit annihilation uh, theory, you kind of have to play around with, with some biblical viewpoints. A fourth belief is that there is only heaven. And you own, everybody gets a card into heaven. Uh, they believe in the restoration of everything. And with that, that restoration, everyone will ultimately be saved. And we're ushered into God's presence. This would be the teaching of universalism. Uh, this teaching, by the way, uh, was introduced quite early. In fact, it was uh, second or third century by uh, Oregon, uh, the Christian theologian of the day. And of course, uh, it has had resurgence in our world today, this concept of, of everybody gets to go to heaven. And the idea behind it is that the unsaved are tortured a little bit possibly uh, but it's only temporary and, and they've got graded punishments and then uh, once they're sufficiently cleansed uh, they are accepted into heaven and, and this historical universalist belief was actually condemned as heresy heresy is the belief that is, is meaning that the belief or the, is contrary to uh, biblical or orthodox religious uh, belief so uh, this was established way back in Oregon's time that it, it was uh, heresy. Uh, and yet it forms a major part of the beliefs of the Universalist Church, now emerged into the Unitarian Universalist Association. So everyone is eventually saved, and they're welcomed into heaven. Those four views, I think you can poke holes into them quite readily. The reality is, from all that we have discussed in this series, not everyone is going to make it to heaven, which brings to the reality the final view, which is heaven or hell. If heaven is real, then hell is real also. This, of course, is the only biblical, biblically supported view um, it's been interesting studying this topic. Uh, when you get into some study of the other four, um, there's a phrase that keeps on coming up, and that is the phrase, I think. Well, I think this. Uh, if you listen to people, they, 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 or they, you read their documents, and they, they, they start off with, I think this. Um, and, and that's a slippery slope to, to kind of get yourself into, to make this comment as such. Um, because the I thinks are personal opinions, and they're not based upon a biblical view. Um, and we said at the outset of this series, we're going to present this using the Word of God, not just someone, someone's viewpoint. So with that, having a biblical view, this is what I said right at the beginning of our series. I said the following, For those who know Christ, believe in Him for salvation, their place is heaven. For those who don't know Christ, reject him in some way, shape, or form. Their place is hell. When we've been looking at heaven, we said really, really early that there are only two ultimate destinations for all of mankind. 
We, we, we have to fit into one of these two categories. It's either heaven or it's hell. Heaven is not our, by the way, our default destination. It's not like, okay, the default is this, and if you're bad, then you get to go to hell. No, the actual default is hell. That is the default, and, and, the, and the reason being is because we are under the curse. We are sinful by nature, so therefore, we, we, we cannot go to heaven because that's a place of holiness and righteousness, and, and that, that's where God is. We can't see him because of, of the, the curse that we have in us. So unless this problem of the curse, unless the sin problem is resolved, the only place we will go is our true default destination. Hell. So let's talk about how the Bible presents what hell will be like. It's going to be uh, six points on this if you're uh, following along, taking notes. First off, hell is as literal as heaven. We have been looking at heaven, and we've established that it is a literal place. Now, in our study in heaven, we've, we've made the distinction between present heaven and the eternal heaven, or the new earth, new heaven, as it's uh, biblically uh, shared in Revelation 21. That's what it's called, the new earth. Uh, we've, at length, we've talked about this. So there is this present heaven where we go when we die, before Jesus returns. When Jesus returns, there's a thousand-year reign, and then there is the eternal heaven, or the new earth and new heaven. The same holds true with hell. If we just call all of that heaven, heaven present, heaven eternal, it's heaven, it's where God is. Uh, that's a really good definition of heaven, by the way. It's where God, it's his place, heaven is God's. Hell is without God. That's a really good definition of hell. Um, so if we do that same kind of concept, prior to Jesus' return, we have present hell, and then we also have the eternal hell once Jesus returns, and then after the thousand-year reign. Biblically, you may hear words such, such like Gehenna, or, or, um, or G Gina, as some people pronounce it, uh, is Gehenna. Uh, that's a, a, a future punishment place. And the imagery is actually this, this name, Gehenna, is, uh, is originally in the, in the uh, south of Jerusalem. There's a, a spot there in the Valley of Hinnom. Uh, and in, in the Valley of Hinnom, there is a, they, this is where they put their garbage and their dead animals and their uh, filth and their rubbish and you name it. And then they would burn it. And, and so south of the city, you would have this burning kind of pit. And, and so this became the imagery, and it fits really well, of this imagery of a future destination of what was considered hell. Uh, you also may have heard the, the terminology uh, Hades or Hades, as some uh, someone like me would pronounce it, but Hades is the uh, the way that the Greek would pronounce it. Uh, this is, if it was a proper noun, uh, that is actually a name of one of the Greek gods, is Hades or Hades, uh, the god of the lower regions, by the way. Um, but in biblical Greek, it is associated with this this infernal region, the dark, dismal place in the very depths of the earth. And usually this is the abode of the wicked. Of It's a, it's a very uncomfortable place, and that's why it's called Hades um, in, in the biblical viewpoint. Later uses of, of, uh, of, of hell would be the grave and death and, and actually hell. Um, and, and in Revelation 20, uh, 14 to 15, just before the ushering of the new earth, we get the explanation. So that's, that's the, uh, by the way, uh, stepping back a little bit, that's the, the present hell. It's either Gehenna or ha Hades. Um, so we've got this concept of, of there is a present hell. Uh, once Jesus returns and uh, there is the great white throne of judgment, that's when there's uh, separation again of 
eternal heaven, new earth, but now you've got the eternal hell, which is, in biblical terms, the lake of fire. Uh, and we'll get into that um, a little bit later. Jesus actually refers uh, more in the Gospels about hell than he does about heaven, funny enough. It's actually double the amount easily, if not more, two and a half times. Jesus refers to hell as a literal place, constantly. He's sharing, and he's constantly looking at it as a, a describing it in graphic terms in a literal sense. Raging fires, um, a worm that doesn't die. Uh, he taught that the, the wicked suffer terribly, are fully conscious, retain their desires and their memories and their reasonings. They, they long for relief. They cannot be comforted. They cannot leave their torment. They're bereft of hope. And all of these, by the way, is just in one story in Luke 16. Other points uh, to hell as being literal. Matthew 10, verse 28. Matthew 13, 40 to 42. Mark 9. 43 to 44. So Jesus points us to the fact that hell is as literal as heaven. Second point is that hell is as eternal as heaven. Mark 25, verse 46. Well, actually, you know what? Let's just, let's just turn to Mark 25. Um, this whole passage is a parable that Jesus teaches, and, and it, he teaches on the sheep and the goats. And it's really a quite fascinating uh, story, and it really, really fits within uh, the concept of hell and heaven. Um, so I'm just going to read the whole passage, because it actually talks about the ultimate separation of, uh, in the parable, it's sheep and goats. And, and so let's, let's start reading this. Matthew 25, and I'm starting in verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory... And all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. By the way, I believe that this, um, th there's already a separation that has happened here. This is actually the great throne, uh, the great white throne that, that uh, um, we see in Revelation. Carry on in verse 34. Um, then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry and free, feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needed clothes and, and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king replied, truly, I tell you, the king will reply, by the way, truly, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or needing clothes, or sick, or in prison, and did not help you? Verse 45, he will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. This passage, this parable, is aligning itself with all other scripture about heaven and about hell. You see, when we die, we face judgment, what is called the judgment of faith. When we die immediately, we're, it's a choice. It, do you have faith? Do you have a belief in Jesus as Lord and Savior? That's the first initial separation between the goats and the sheep. You've got those that believe in Jesus, they'll be ushered into the present heaven, and those that do not believe, and they're ushered into the, the, the present hell. And then at the end, when the, when the righteous uh, the, the big judgment happens. 
when you read the rest of this story, you read that there's the final judgment. And there we read this, this other separation that happens based upon what, what they did. And, and we've expressed this already in this series. There is a, a judgment first of faith, and then the great white throne is all about what we've done here on earth. And, and there is still that separation between those that are righteous and those that are, are unrighteous. And we see in a number of times in this passage that Jesus talks about eternal punishment. Verse 41 which, again, references Revelation 20 really, really seamlessly, and we'll we'll talk about that in a minute. But look at verse 46, the ending verse. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. A lot of times we focus on the last two words, eternal life. Oh, yeah, that's what I want. That's what I desire. That's eternal life. I get that. But we miss out that they go away to eternal punishment. Jesus uses the the exact same Greek word for both. Eternal. Ionos is the Greek word, which literally means without end, never to cease, everlasting. And it describes the duration of both heaven as well as hell. Punishment. So if heaven will be consciously experienced forever, hell must be consciously experienced forever as well. A little note about this, about what Jesus has done for us. By denying the endlessness of hell, the eternity of hell, we actually minimize Christ's work. His work on the cross will be minimized if we have this viewpoint that, oh, it may, it's not eternal. Why? Because we lower the stakes of redemption. It kind of kind of flattens what Jesus did for us by by his his crucifixion and his resurrection. It, if Christ's crucifixion and resurrection didn't deliver us from an eternal hell, his work on the cross is, is just a little bit less. It's less potent, it's it's less consequential, it's less deserving, which is deserving of our worship and praise. I love how theologian William G.T. Shedd put it. He says, The doctrine of Christ's vicarious atonement logically stands or falls with that of eternal punishment. So hell is eternal as heaven. Eternal hell will be inhabited by Satan and the fallen angels. That's the third point. Eternal hell will will be inhabited by Satan and the fallen angels. There was no question that we read that that parable of the sheep and the goats. We know full well why hell was created. It says right in verse 41, it's a place of punishment designed for Satan and the fallen angels. Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire, prepare for the devil and his angels. And we see this actually take place in Revelation 20. So flip over to Revelation 20. And in verse 10. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night Forever, the devil there being Satan. So eternal hell will be inhabited by Satan and the fallen angels. But fourthly, hell will be inhabited by unbelievers. Hell will be a place that will be inhabited by those who do not accept God's gift of salvation. God's gift of a Savior. As we read further in Revelation 20, it makes it so, so clear. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it, the earth and the heavens fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead, that's righteous and unrighteous, 
were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what they had done. This is the second judgment. First judgment was based upon our faith. Verse 14, Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. And then verse 15, Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. And the only way that you can have your name written in the book of life is if you have faith and belief in Jesus Christ and also follow His commands. The great white throne judgment brings those on the earth when Jesus returns, those that are living at the time of Jesus' return. It brings those who are in the present hell. It brings those that are in the present heaven. And it judges all of them accordingly. And the separation happens. Either heaven or to the lake of fire, the eternal hell what we now refer to as hell, will also be relo relocated. Just like our, our, our present heaven will be relocated. The present Jerusalem will be relocated. The new Jerusalem will drop down in the new earth. The new earth, the old earth, will be redeemed and restructured to be the new earth. The hell will be restructured into the lake of fire. Point five. hell will be, is, and will be later, a horrible place. It will be a horrible place of suffering, of everlasting destruction. We see this in Matthew 13, uh, 41 and 42. Jesus tells us of a fiery furnace, and in that place will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Uh, and this concept of suffering and, and torment is presented again by Jesus in, in the heaven and hell story uh, with Lazarus and the rich man and Abraham. That's found in Luke 16, 22 to 31. And in that passage, we, we get this idea, and that's the, the present heaven and the present hell. Uh, we've got this rich man, and it, said, it says there that he's in torment in verse 23. And he begs for even the smallest amount of water to relieve his suffering. In verse 24, he says of, of himself that I'm, I'm tormented in this flame. And then Abraham actually makes the comment that, that, that uh, he's tormented dis to describe his condition in hell. Another passage, Jesus, Matthew 25, verse 30, he says, uh, there's a, hell will be a place of outer, outer darkness where they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth again. Uh, a, little, a little side note to, to uh, give some levity to the situation because I know some people get a little, little freaked out over all of this, so uh, just a little bit of levity. There's a story of a, uh, an evangelist who was preaching on, on, on that very statement, the, the weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. He was really getting into it, and then suddenly this little old woman stands up at the, the, uh, uh, from the balcony and, and, and yells out, says, Sir, I have no teeth! To which the uh, evangelist replied, Madam, teeth will be provided. I don't know if that's true. But we do know and get the sense that hell would be a horrible place. 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 9. And if, if you could grab that verse and, and kind of put it out there. Uh, write it down somewhere. Uh, it's in it's kind of the highlight, I think, of of our study. Second Thessalonians one verse nine. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. You see, last week we talked about the glory of God. We talked about this, this new Jerusalem, God's city coming down onto the new earth. And it was glorious, the city of God, the glory of God, and, and it will emanate from the throne. Not so in hell. 
hell is truly the absence of God. Because God is the source of, of, of light, of good, of you name it. God is the source of that. So things that we see in, in heaven, things like community and, and fellowship and, and friendship, and we saw that all very vividly. Those are good. They're rooted in the triune God himself. But in the absence of God, hell will have no community, no camaraderie, no, no friendship. P people think, that, oh, yeah, I'm just going to hang out with my buddies in hell, play in pool and smoke in cigars. Uh, no, you're not. You're going to be a separated from God. And God is the ushering uh, in of, of fellowship and community. And so you won't have any of that. You don't see the rich man in Luke um, 16 reveling in this fellowship with his buddies. What you see is him very much alone. Hell will be lonely. I said earlier in, in a previous message that, that the new, what we see in the new earth now are glimpses of the old earth now are glimpses though that thing those things that are removed of the curse and 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 and, and sinful um they're, they're going to be removed but we have glimpses of what the new earth will look like just glimpses of it once it's redeemed so all the good that we see on this earth we can get a glimpse of what the new earth will be like and the same i think will applies to what evil we see in this earth. What, what grossness we see in this earth. The worst of life on this earth will just be a glimpse of what we will experience in hell if we have to go there. Erwin Lutzer, he used to be the uh, pastor of Moody Church in Chicago, Illinois. He points out this very, very vivid uh, picture. He says, The most sobering thought that could ever cross our minds is the fact that the rich man in hell, in Hades, in Hades, has not yet received the drop of water for which he has so desperately longed. Hell will be horrible. which leads to my final point. There is no hope. Well, there's a little phrase that, that we, we say, and we say it jokingly, and I've heard it lots. Um, if something we can't do or, or, someone, or someone else can't do it, we, 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 we say this phrase, which is, there's not a hope in hell that that's ever going to work. And the sad reality is, there is no hope in hell. None. As a literal, eternal, the habitation of Satan and his fallen angels, the habitation of unbelievers, the place that is absolutely horrible, there is no hope. In hell, people are conscious, full of regret. They retain all their capacities and desires with no hope for any fulfillment for all of eternity. That's what we see in Luke 16. It is impossible to forget when you're in hell. The rich man could not take his money, but he could take his memories. And that's what bothered him so much. There's no way out for him. See, you cannot get out of hell. When you're there, you're there. And you're there forever. Some teach that you can work your way out of hell. That would certainly be wonderful. That is not scriptural. That is nowhere to be found in the Word of God. You cannot get a transfer. You cannot work yourself out. You cannot work your way out of hell. There is no crossing over. Abraham explains this in, in Luke 16 passage with the rich man and... and, and uh, and, and Lazarus, there's a great chasm between heaven and hell. In other words, there's no hope of crossing from one place to the other. The rich man's destiny was set. Those that go into hell are set there forever. There is no hope. 
There's no hope of escape. There's no hope of relief. Hell is not like a prison where you might get paroled or you might get pardoned. Do your time and be released. No. Hell is forever and inescapable. Hell. The present hell, which leads to the new hell, for a lack of a better term, following our terms from the new earth and new heaven, will be a literal, eternal habitation of Satan and his fallen angels, a habitation of unbelievers that is absolutely horrible with no hope. You see, after Christ returns, there will be a resurrection of believers for eternal life in heaven, a resurrection of unbelievers for eternal existence in hell. I haven't shared this verse yet. John 5, 28 and 29. Jesus says this, Do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done what is good will rise to life, and those who have done what is evil will rise to be condemned. The problem is sometimes the question is raised. How could a loving, good God send people to hell? This is def definitely a problem in our, in our brains. Um, and, and, and sometimes it's, it's such, it, it is so overwhelming that it actually produces in us a view of God that is improper. You see, the, the question that comes is, is hell is disproportionate. It, it's, it's a divine uh, overreaction. It's not needful to go that far. We're not God. We're humans created by God. And yet we still have this concept that, 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 that if God is loving, then he has to be so loving that he'll allow people into heaven. Anyone. Charles Char Clark Pinnock. He was a Canadian uh, theologian and uh, uh, passed away back in 2010. And uh, he, he had this problem with this, this concept of, of hell. And this is what he wrote. He said, I, and this is a theologian, by the way, a guy that studies. He says, I consider the concept of hell as endless torment in body and mind, an outrageous doctrine. How can Christians possibly project a deity of such cruelty and vindictiveness whose ways include inflicting everlasting torture upon his creatures, however simple they may have been? Surely, a God who would do such a thing is more nearly like Satan than like God. That's being honest. And let me be clear about something. If I had a choice, that is, if, if, if the word of God were not so clear and conclusive, I would certainly not want to believe in hell. I, I would love for everyone to be into heaven. Trust me when I say, I, I do not want to believe in it. But if I make it what I want to believe in, or what someone else wants me to believe, then the basis of my beliefs is not Christ. It's not in the Word of God. It's not God at all. The basis of my beliefs is, is either myself, who I am following, uh, whether that be myself or whether that be uh, someone else who, who's directing me and giving me ideas. I think you should follow this. Or, or my culture. Well, you know what? That was passe. That was back then. So you have to believe in this now because the new culture is 20,020 for crying out loud. But the Word of God says, follow after God. You're a follower of Christ if you say that you're a Christian. And unfortunately, he says, this is hell, this is heaven. The Word of God is very clear on the subject. The most basic truth is that there are only two possible destinations after death, heaven and hell. Each is just as real, just as eternal as the other. And unless and until 
we surrender our lives over to Jesus Christ, we're headed to the default, which is hell. The most loving thing that we can do for ourselves is to surrender to the love and the grace that is found in Jesus Christ, to believe in him, follow hard after him, obey him in this life. And the most loving thing that we can do for our friends and our family is to warn them about the road that leads to destruction and tell them about the road that leads to life, leads to eternal life. Jesus made it clear. The gate, the gate is narrow. The way is, is, is narrow. The gate is small. The, uh, he is the only way. Uh, God loves us enough to tell us the truth. Sometimes we think, oh, God must not love us because he, he's going to send some people to hell. Actually, he's given, he loves us so much that he's telling us. He's made it abundantly clear about himself and his son. He's told us there are two eternal destinations, not one. And we must choose in this life the right path if we are going to go to heaven. All roads do not lead to heaven. Only one does. And Jesus Christ is the only road. He even said, no one comes to the Father except through me, John 14, 6. All other roads, unfortunately, leave to hell. You see, 1 Corinthians 6.20 mentions that we're bought with a price. The price was Jesus Christ's death and resurrection. The price has been paid for us to go to heaven. The price was beyond what you and I could even, even imagine to pay. But God sent his son so that we can have eternal life. The price is paid, but we still get to choose. Like any gift, forgiveness can be offered, but it's not received as a gift until we actually choose to receive it. It'd be like this. If, if, if a, a criminal, when he, he knows full well that he, he, he's done wrong, and we know we know, the, we know good and evil. That's knowledge that we have. And so we know wrong. So if he's convicted and he knows he's wrong, and, and for whatever reason, the, the governor or the, 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 the prime minister or the king or the, you know, whoever gives out pardons of the day hands this criminal a pardon and says, you know what? You are pardoned from all your mistakes, all your sin, all your stuff. And a criminal just says, eh, eh, doesn't receive it. Whose fault is that? You see, it, does it invalidate the pardon? No. The pardon just wasn't accepted. Similarly, Christ offers each of us the gift of forgiveness and the gift of eternal life. But just because the offer is made doesn't make it ours. To have it, we, I, you, have to choose to accept it. We have to understand that God loves us so much that he respects our decisions. He loves us, but he does not force his love on us. To force love on someone is actually, uh, uh, I, I think, would be offensive. Can't force someone to love you. So he allows us to decide, do you, do you love me? It, he shows us in his world. Everything points to the glory and the majesty of God. That's what the psalm says. And he encourages us to respond to his love. He even pursues us. That nagging little thing, that's God. Obey him. Surrender to him. He urges us, but he will not force us. He knows what a better life is for us, and he knows the direction of what will harm us in this world as well as in the world to come. 
He loves us enough to allow us to make our own decisions. People on their own without Christ cannot enter the presence of a holy and just God in heaven. And so therefore, they will be consigned to a place of everlasting destruction. Hell will be a place of utter misery. It will be a place of conscious punishment for sins that we've done here with no hope of relief. Let me pray. Oh, God. This is hard teaching. But I want to praise you that you've made every opportunity for your creation to come to know you. We see you in creation. We see you in how we are formed. We see you in the wind. We see you in the mountains. We see you in a flower. We see you in, in animals. We see, we see your creation, and it points to you. And then as that deepens, we hear about your love for us by sending your son to die on a cross. And through that crucifixion, that horrible death, and that burial, but yet there's resurrection. And in that, we, as fallen human beings, as those that are cursed, those that have sin natures, we can, based upon belief and, and obedience in Jesus Christ, we can be redeemed. We can be ushered into a new earth and a new heaven with you and to see you face to face. We have the choice. And yet you make the choice ours. So, Father, for those that are listening to this that have not made that choice, I pray that they will understand hell is real and it's not funny. It is a place that will be in torment forever. It will be separation from you forever. And we may not know all the ins and outs of it, and we may question it, and yet you've, make, you've made it abundantly clear. We may say that it's stacked against us, this belief thing, but it's not. You've shown yourself to be true, to be loving, to be kind. Allow us, Father, to rest in the knowledge of the Savior of the world so that we can come to know you and come to be with you forever. Bless us and dismiss us in your grace and in your love. In Christ's name, amen. One uh, thing before I, I uh, close. I want us to consider all of these things, of course. Um, and, and if you do believe they are true, and if you are a believer in Christ, um, we have the greatest news possible. So share it. You do not want people to go to that place of destruction. And, 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 it, and it brings to mind, why, why don't we? <laughs> are we scared? Are we worried about what others will say or might think about us? I'll leave you with this thought. 1992, Mercedes-Benz Car Company. They are renowned for safety. If you don't know that, look them up. They're, they, they are the world's leader in safety innovation. Well, back in 1992, Mercedes-Benz made a commercial about their crumple zones of their vehicles. And you can find it on YouTube if you want. But uh, in, in this video, there's, there's, uh, there's all these test cars that are crashing into walls and, and kind of weird stuff. And, and, then, and then you see two gentlemen having a conversation. And one's a reporter and one's an engineer. And the dialogue is important because this is what it says. The reporter is talking to this engineer and he says, So, uh, how many cars does Mercedes test crash every year? And the engineer kind of, huh, well, you know, uh, I say about 100. Uh, you can never learn enough, he says. 
Ever since we had it patented, we have been improving this concept of the energy absorbing car body. That's what he says. And then the, the reporter goes, but, but wait, other companies actually use that same concept, the, the crumple zone kind of concept. And the engineer goes, eh, we, we've never enforced the patent. And the reporter kind of goes, well, so uh, Mercedes gave away a basic safety advantage for free? And the engineer replies, matter of fact. There are some things in life that are too important not to share. Too important not to share. There are lots of things in our world that, that fall into that category. Huh, a crumple-free zone, a crumple zone in vehicles for safety, without question. Seat belts with the, uh, the over the shoulder, around the, yeah, that, that same, same idea. The too important not to share. Advances in science, advances in medicine. We're looking for a, a vaccine for COVID, but if someone kind of gets it, it just kind of keeps it, that we go, what in the world? It's too important not to share. We have our eternal destination conversation today. Does that fall into the same category? Is that too important not to share?